In today's tutorial, we're going to learn a technique that might seem very basic and simple. However, it's so powerful that I've actually had to skip multiple different tutorials because I couldn't figure out how to do exactly what I'm going to teach in today's video. We're going to create this loop and in the process, learn how to do this technique that I'm talking about. So with that, let's actually understand the problem that we're trying to solve. For now, if you were to add any sort of texture to either displace or have in your shader editor, if you use something like the noise texture, you'll see that the noise texture is completely random and it does not repeat over any distance on either of the axes, X, Y, or the Z axis. It's never going to have this exact same structure repeating. If you were to tile it and have it repeat after a specific amount, this junction will not be the same. And you see, it's not gonna match up. It's gonna start from here again. So essentially it would look something like this where yeah it is repeating this again but there's a discontinuity at this section so i want a situation where this particular displacement is continuous over a repeating time or at least a repeating section hopefully i was able to make sense of the problem statement i couldn't really explain it that well but i think you'll get a better understanding when we start working out the problem so let's actually go ahead and start messing around with the system. So the first thing that we need is a geometry node setup. So we'll bring our cursor to the junction of these two windows, click and drag to create a new window and change this from the 3D viewport to the geometry node editor. Then we'll press this plus button to create a new geometry node tree, after which we'll zoom in, select the group input and tap X to delete it. Now let's press shift A and search for a grid which is going to be the plane on which we're going to add in our displacement. Of course, we require the plane to be much larger and much more subdivided. So to make it much larger, we can just change the size on the X and the Y to something like 10 meters. And to actually give it some more displacement, we're going to go ahead and subdivide it. For that, we're going to use a subdivide mesh node for which we have to press shift A and search for the subdivide mesh. Remember, you could increase the number of vertices right here as well, but I think using a subdivide mesh allows us to control it much easier later on. So let's just plug this in and we can switch over to our wireframe view by pressing this button so that you can see how subdivided it is. Let's increase the number of subdivisions to something like seven. And that way you see we get a really dense mesh, which is not going to create too much of a lag on our PC. Now that we have that set up, we can go back to our solid viewport shading and start giving it some actual displacement. For the displacement, we're going to have to search for a set position node and plug that in right over here. For the offset, we're going to use a noise texture. And that is where we're going to start understanding where our issue is. Right now, the noise texture is far too chaotic. Let's reduce the scale down to something like 0.3 and that makes it much smoother. The next thing is that it shifted up towards the right because the noise texture goes from 0 to 1. We need it to go from minus 0.5 to 0.5 so it's centered around 0. For that we can search for a vector map node. We can plug that in and just subtract 0.5 on all of the axes. And along with that you see it's actually going to a value of 0.5 at most. We want it to be much higher so we can use another vector map node by pressing shift D and this time instead of subtract we can change this to scale. So if I just zoom in so you can see it better, we have to choose scale and now we can actually increase the displacement. This shows us another issue and that is that this noise texture is in three dimensions. So it's actually moving it on all of the axes. And that's why when we scale it up, there is a lot of overlap. That's not really what we want. This would work really well if you were trying to create some type of plot, but that's not what we're going for today. So what we can do is make sure that this is happening only on the Z axis. For that, we can use another vector math node, plug that in right over here and this time change it to multiply and multiply multiplied by zero on the X and the Y and just one on the Z axis. So now it's moving up and down only on the Z axis, allowing us to keep the wave like structure without any overlap. Now this is one method of doing it, but this requires three vector math nodes and that might be a little bit heavier on the laptop, but since we're doing just one, it's perfectly all right. However, another method of doing this is simply using a combined XYZ node and just using normal math nodes, such as a math node set from add to subtract so that we subtract out a value of 0.5 and then another math node set to multiply. And this time we can multiply it by a value of six, which is the same scaling that we did over here. Plug this value into the first socket. This one goes in here and this one can go into just the Z. And now this vector can go into the offset. We should get something very, very similar, but it will be faster for Blender to calculate, especially if you have a lot of objects in the scene. Now that's great, but I want this texture to keep moving and I want it to move in a specific direction. We have created multiple looping textures for the noise texture before by changing this to 4D and then playing around with the W value. Now this we can perfectly loop 
by using two noise textures and actually mixing them together using a mixed color. You can maybe check out this particular tutorial over here where we have looped the noise texture like this. Or if you want to learn how to create a looping noise texture node, you can check out this particular video over here. And I will be releasing one specifically for geometry nodes very soon as well. However, that isn't the type of looping that we want because moving the W will make it move in a fourth dimension, but not in one specific direction. In my case right now, I actually want these to look like it's actually swaying towards the right. Now, one way we can get this to move towards the right is by pressing Shift A, searching for a position node and plugging that into the vector and simply adding some value towards the X axis. To add in a value, we search for another vector math node, plug that in right here. And now you can see that by adding some value on the X axis, we're able to make it look like it's swaying towards one particular side. We can always go in the opposite direction as well. And this is the exact issue that we're trying to solve. I want it to move in this particular direction, but while moving in this direction, I also want it to loop. Now that's something that I genuinely did not know how to do until a few days ago when I watched a video by Erendale. The link to that video will be attached as a card as well as present in the description where he actually explains how you can get this done. Of course, we are making a few modifications to suit our requirements, but the idea is the exact same. The aim is to actually change this texture space from a linear coordinate system into a circular coordinate system. In order to do that, we're going to have to go ahead and press shift A and search for a math node. And we have to make sure that this math node is set to sign and another one, which is going to be a cosine because sine and cosine allows us to change between a rectangular coordinate system as well as a polar coordinate system or a circular coordinate system. The way we use these sines and cosines is explained very well by Erendale. However, if you do want me to explain what is happening again, do let me know in the comments below and I'll make another video where I actually explain what's happening in this section. But for now, let's go ahead and just shift all of this to the side because we want to place something into this particular vector. What we want is to actually search for a combined XYZ node and simply use this vector as the vector input. And for the X and the Y, we're going to use the sine as well as the cosine of these particular position coordinates. So the first thing that we need to do is separate out the XYZ of the position coordinates. So let's search for a separate XYZ node, plug that in over here. We can remove the add node for now and just take the X and plug that into both this sine as well as this cosine. Now this is having some sort of repetition for the X axis every two pi lengthwise. So you can actually see that in six units, if we go over to the front view, this particular area is repeating right over here. After this, we have this particular section and over here as well, we have this particular section. So that is happening once every two pi distance. However, we need the same thing to happen on the Y axis as well. So we take this sine and cosine, press shift D to duplicate it, take it off from the Y, plug it in right here as well as here. And now plug this into the Z axis and we need this fourth axis over here. And that is going to have it perfectly loop or tile every 6.28 units on both the X axis as well as the Y axis. So we have to ensure that this is going from six to eight. So the way we're going to do that is by actually moving this position along the X axis by that two pi distance. So again, we can search for a vector math node, plug that in right here. And instead of adding in a value and keyframing it over here, what we're going to do is we'll just pin this, press shift A and search for an empty plane axis, which we are actually going to move. Let's drag that into this geometry node over here and then make this relative so that we can get the location of this empty that's present over here. Again, we want the X location of the empty. So let's search for a separate X, Y, Z node, take out just the X location. And now we want to make sure that this X location yields a value that goes from zero to two pi. However, we want to move this by maybe two pi units, maybe 10 units. We'll take a look at that later on. But for now, we're just going to use a map range node, plug that in over here so that I know that the value is going to go from zero to something. We'll see that later on, but the two min is going to be zero and the two max has to be two pi, which we can actually do by typing in two star pi, or we can type in tau tau. Now let's take this map range result and again, use a combine XYZ. So press shift A, search for combine XYZ and plug this into the X value and plug that into the vector. Now, if we were to take the empty and just press GX, you can actually move it. And since we have this set as from zero to one, if we were to move this from zero to one unit, this will move through one particular loop. So we can simply do that. Let's just go ahead and change this to 10 units so that the there's actually quite a bit of movement on the empty just so that it's easier for us to visualize later on. If you wanted to move in the opposite direction, maybe you can start the empty at a value of 10 and then move it to zero. Or you could say 
from a min of minus 10 to a max of zero as well. And that way you can take this empty and move it in the negative X axis. And that's going to move everything towards the right side. So it's really up to you and what you do. I'll just leave it like this for now. Now that's actually all we have to do for that. The last thing that we need to do for this node setup is press shift A and search for a set shade smooth node. Plug that in right over here so that it becomes completely smooth. And we also have to set the material. So let's press shift A, search for set material and plug that in right here. For the material, we'll choose the default material because we're not using that for anything else. Now we'll go ahead and set up the animation. So for the animation, we'll bring up our timeline a little bit. We'll go to our output properties. We'll change our resolution to 4K. We'll change the frame rate to 30 frames per second. And the reason why I'm making this 4K and not 30, but 60 frames per second is so that all of you can get the 4K 60 FPS files from my Patreon. And in case you don't want to build up this node setup or the material by yourself, you can buy just this project file along with the rendered animations from my Patreon store, or you could sign up for my monthly tiers where you'll get all of these that are released every single month. I'll change the end frame to something like 300 so that it becomes a five second long animation. Output folder can be wherever you want to store it. File format, we're going to choose FFmpeg video with the encoding changed from Matroska to MPEG-4 and an output quality of Percept 3 lossless. Then back on frame zero with the empty selected, we'll go ahead and press I location and then we'll go to the last frame, which is frame 300 and we'll just press G X minus 10 and we'll press I location. And now if we were to play the animation, it'll start off slow and then speed up in the middle and then slow down again at the end. Remember, you can change the playback from play every frame to frame dropping to get a realistic idea of how fast it's going to be moving without any actual lag. So we don't want it to slow down and speed up in the middle. So down here, we'll press T and choose linear and that way we'll get a smooth speed as it goes from the beginning to the end, making it a perfect loop. However, there's one more issue with this. If you were to just look at this, these particular shapes are all moving towards the right, which is correct, but they're not actually dynamic. It looks very, very static. Something that's a wave should have some more motion to it, which ideally we would get by playing around with the W value of the noise texture. However, the W value is already occupied for the Y axis. Since we don't actually need the Y axis repetition, we could actually remove this and then play around with the W value by ourselves. But that's not exactly what I want to do in this case. Instead, a simpler way to actually get this is adding in another noise texture that will be superimposed on this first one. So let's take this noise texture plus shift D to duplicate it and this time change it from 4D to 3D because we don't actually need it to be 4D. Now we can press shift A and search for a vector math node, plug that in right over here and just add in this particular noise texture. Now that it's been added in, remember it shoots up because of that 0.5 that we have. So let's press shift A, search for another vector math node, plug that in right here and just subtract out a value of 0.5 to bring it down again to the center. Now, when you play the animation, you'll still see an overarching movement towards the right side, but along with that motion, there's this dynamic movement that just makes this look so much better. And that's actually all there is for the animation and geometry node section. Next, let's move on to the texturing. For the texturing, we're gonna switch our viewport shading to rendered by pressing this button up here, and we'll switch this particular window from the geometry node editor to the shader editor. Then we'll go to our render properties switch on bloom and screen space reflection. And we'll finally select our main cube. And since it's the default cube, the default material is already applied. So we don't have to go ahead and select it from this dropdown. If you don't see the actual material nodes over here, you can tap A to select everything in period on your numpad to centralize the nodes. Now I just want some lines to be going across just like this. So I'm going to make this completely metallic. And for the normal, I'm going to use a bump node. Now this bump node has to have some height put into it. And I'm going to get the height from a noise texture and a wave texture so that we can get random lines along the X axis. So let's press shift A, search for a wave texture and let's search for a noise texture. We can plug the wave textures output into the input of the noise texture. And of course you could use a color ramp node to make the noise texture more contrasty. Let's plug the color into the factor and just control shift click it with the node wrangler enabled to preview what this currently looks like. Now we are getting some lines along the Y axis. That isn't what we want. So let's change this from X to Y so that it runs along the X axis. Along with that, we do get some noise in between each wave texture, but it's repeating way too much. So let's start off by just reducing this scale until we don't have that many repetitions, or even if we do have repetitions, it's barely noticeable. For that, we can just keep it at a very low scale. Let's go with something like 0.2 four and that should be good enough. However, for the noise texture, we can increase this scale to make many more lines appear and to make these lines much more contrasty. Just pull in the black, pull in the white, and that should make the lines much more prominent. Now this can go into the height of the bump node 
and then we can control shift click the principal BSDF to actually preview what the output is going to look like. Now, obviously there's way too much of bump. So let's go ahead and reduce the strength from one to something really low, maybe something like 0.2. And that looks a lot better. Now that's actually all there is for the bump. So we now need to actually play around with the color. For the color, I'm actually gonna set up my camera and have it as a gradient from my camera's perspective. So let's press zero to go into my camera view. And then I can just select the camera and press G to move it around within my view so that I can place it appropriately. Or I can tap N to open the side panel and then just go to my view tab over here and switch on camera to view. So once I have this selected, I can move around as I would generally move around my 3D scene to place my camera into some area that I think suits the particular scene. So I think that's all right. And once I have it set, I'll tap N and just switch this off so that I don't accidentally move my camera. Now that I have that set up perfectly, I can go to my camera properties, go down to the viewport display and increase pass power two all the way to one so that I don't see anything outside my camera view. Now let's switch off overlays and this looks great. Next for the base color, let's set up a gradient. Let's Let's search for a gradient texture and now with the node wrangler enabled i'll go ahead and select it and press ctrl t to get the texture coordinate and mapping nodes to make sure that the gradient goes from right to left of my screen i'll switch over to the window coordinates and now if i was just to ctrl shift click the gradient texture you should be able to see it starts from black here and ends up as white over here now i can pass that through a color ramp to give the base color so let's search for a color ramp node plug that in right here and you can choose whatever colors you want you can add in as many stops as you want by pressing this plus button and just choosing appropriate colors. Maybe I'll make this one somewhat like an orange. Then I can add in another stop that might just be red. Then maybe this central one could be a bluish color. Again, I'm going to make this very bright. Maybe this could be a lighter blue. Let's go with something like that. Let's just respace these appropriately. And I think that should be good enough. Let's plug this into the base color and then control shift click the principal PSDF. Now that looks great. I think I'm just going to add in some more light from this direction because right now the default light is present right over here, which is the top right. Let's press shift D and move it to the top left as well. So now there's light coming in from this direction as well as this direction. I might change this a bit because I think these are a bit too sharp. So instead of linear, I'll change this to ease. And now that transition looks a lot smoother, but I still might play around with these just before rendering. Similarly, you can play around with the roughness as well, which will help increase and decrease the actual amount of reflections. But all of that is your own personal preference. In my render properties, I also want to change my color management from filmic to AGX and the background I'm gonna actually keep as a complete black. And once you're happy with the way everything looks, you can always go ahead and just render out the animation. I hope this was a very fun tutorial and honestly this particular requirement comes up in so many situations especially when you're doing motion graphics that it's really really useful to know by yourself. It's actually such an important concept that a few of the previous animations that I always wanted to create I will be recreating now that I know how to create this particular effect. So until those videos come out thank you so much for watching and do drop down some questions below because I do intend on answering a lot of your questions in the form of a video very soon soon to celebrate getting 4,000 subscribers. Until my next video comes out, thank you so much for watching. Keep creating and don't forget to stay creative.